How many trades did you do last week? How many winners and how many losers? What worked for you? What didn't work for you? Why didn't it work for you? What do you need to improve on? What emotional states? How can you improve for this week? What would you like to address to me? Uh, teacher's assistant, trader? What would you like to be held accountable for for this week? How many chapters of the book did you read last week for review? We're almost finished. We're trading the zone, and we're going to go to the next book pretty much uh, when we come back from our break. What did you get out from what you have read, and what actions will you take immediately within the next 24 hours after these group coaching sessions? All right, so uh, it's 11.04. I'll give you guys around five minutes to complete. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. Oh, hi Vicky, thanks for coming in as well. So we're just doing this uh, 13 questions. They're answering this, uh, the 13 questions for about five or so minutes. We're gonna discuss it for about five to 10 and then we're gonna do the round table with you, Vicky. So, okay. uh, great.
All right, so let's talk about this quickly. Um, how many trades did you do last week? We'll do it uh, less than 10 seconds, OK? I'll start from bottom to top. Lisa, how many did you do? Um, I did 13. 13, uh, great. Uh, Vicky, how many did you do last week? Um, 17. 17. Sarah, how many did you do last week? Ten. Ten. Uh, Samantha? Um, two real ones, five demos. Great. Mike? Four real ones and three demos. Okay. Uh, Caitlin? Ten. Ten. Jeff? Uh, uh, show of 23. 23. Uh, and? Three. All right. So, great. Um, how many winners? How many losers? Uh, Lisa? Um, nine wins and then four losers. Okay, great. Uh, Sarah? Uh, five wins. Five okay. Wins. Uh, Vicky? Um, nine wins, six lose. Okay. Yeah. Um, Caitlin? Um, four wins, six wins. All right, Samantha. Um, on my live ones, two wins, and then three of the five. Okay. Um, Jeff? I'm not sure because I came a little late to class. But yeah. I didn't get to take down. Okay. Uh, Mike? Um, four, uh, three, or four losses and three wins. All right, and... Two wins, one loss. Okay, so um, it's imperative uh, to track. Basically, that's how you can track your statistics down as well. So you should have an Excel spreadsheet that you'll be able to track all those. All right, what worked for you last week? What didn't work for you? Why didn't it work for you? What do you need to improve on? What emotional states? How can you improve? So if uh, I'll give you guys just one minute to summarize it all, okay? I'll start from Lisa, so one minute. Um, last week what worked was trading the Euro session and what didn't work is trying to trade the US session because um, I kind of turned into a night owl so I couldn't wake up in the morning to trade the, um, the US session, uh, but that's not a problem. Um, it didn't work because it's hard to adjust um, your like, schedule. Um, um, for this week, I want to improve on avoiding, um, avoiding trading before the event, and then just trade the reaction. Um, that's my personal preference right now. Um, emotional state, I, um, I don't remember. Um, and I didn't have time to think about the other one. Okay, not a problem. Seems probably time is a little bit more a constraint. Um, I tell you what, this is what we're going to do. Um, I'll email you guys this uh, soft copy. If you don't have one, then email it to me that would be then part of your homework, okay? So this is basically for everybody. Um, just to have a little bit more time to think about what you guys really n need to do for, for this whole week. Because uh, this question is actually really important um, in terms of uh, performance. All right, so we'll go through uh, very quickly in terms of uh, just the book. Who read at least one chapter of the book last week? Yeah, yeah, I read one chapter. Okay, great. Even better, who didn't read yeah. at all last week? Are we talking about... I read, but I... Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll, ahead, admit, I'll admit that I read the first chapter and need to be caught up. That was my goal this week. Finish okay. the book by Friday. All right, great. Uh, Jeff?
Are we still in the training zone? Training Sorry. Zone, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I got halfway to chapter ten. Yeah. Alrighty. Then yeah. just summarize. Just give me then a quick summary of what you learned. Uh, based on chapter now 10 of Trading the Zone. For those who either finished the book or read the book, okay, or for those who got caught up. Okay, let's start from you, Lisa. Uh, let me get my notes real quick. Okay, uh, Vicky. Okay, I read the chapter on tolerating the pain. Is that chapter 10? I can't remember the sequence of the chapters, but I just picked up like chapters which are uh, like relate to me at that point in time okay and yeah that was that chapter on tolerating the pain and that really helped okay excellent um yeah because it, it's like you i think one of the points is trying to make is that you have to get to the level where you feel the pain and you get past it and then you can progress beyond that because right, the pain great. doesn't mean anything to you anymore after that yeah. That's true. That's true. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Sarah, what did you learn from uh, what chapter that you caught up with? So what was the last um, chapter that you read? I'm up to chapter 10. Okay, great. And I, I like the bit, this is about <laughs> relating it to a child with a dog. Mm -hmm. had a bad experience and your belief is that, you know, you've had a bad experience and that's how always your child experience dog but someone's perspective from outside knows that you know there's that's not going to happen every time there's there are you know good uh situations with a dog and a child and so same with our belief in trade and if we've had a bad experience then we need to you know know that it, there is going to be good ones and that belief in it so yeah good nice uh mike For chapter 10, correct? Correct. Okay. I got that there's a lot of uh, information. If you want to know everything, uh, police are conscious energies and their uh, requirements in order to integrate the five fundamental truths, which is to resist any um, force or resistance of energy that alters the present, all lack of beliefs, demand expression, um, to does the 30 day challenge of the affirmation and police will always be existing. Okay. Uh, good. Alrighty. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I actually learned a lot. Um, I'll just give you one quote that I really got. It's uh, remember that every thought, word, and deed reinforce some belief we have about ourselves. And so I know there was three steps. I didn't get through the whole chapter, chapter 10, but. I know what you tell yourself is what comes with belief. So um, whether you say, dang, I'm screw up, then if you consistently start saying you're a screw up, then you start believing and start making a belief of yourself. But if you start saying that you are a consistent, awesome beast trader like myself, then you become an awesome beast trader like yourself. So that's what I got from chapter 10. Well, that portion. Of course, there's two more steps there. There's three like steps in advance. Okay, great. Um, let's go with, uh, Caitlin. Um, so I'm on chapter seven and something that stood out for me was that you have to understand that each time you get into an M2, it doesn't matter how, or an M3, it doesn't matter if it looks perfect or it looks like all these other ones that worked out in the past. Um, you have to accept that every single trade is different because all the people that are buying and selling are different. You know, you just can't, to expect that every trade will turn out the same way as irrational, you just okay. have to trust that you have an edge, and you have to trust that if you put in enough trades, every time that they come up, in the end, you will make more money, and you just have to, but you have to accept that um, expecting them all to act out the same way is totally rational, because it's totally impossible. Okay, good. Uh, Samantha. Oh, yeah, so, um, honestly, I liked, I think the, I've read the first chapter, like, 20 million times, so I always start and then, like, don't go past it for some reason, but, um, yeah, anyway, I liked how he said how, like, people start their trading careers, like, um, they're either born into it or they need to learn it right the first time, 
Um, I thought that was really cool because, like, we're really lucky to, like, have you as our mentor versus, like, anyone else, like Kramer or, you know. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and um, that it's – the best traders need to put on a trade without any kind of hesitation or conflict, and that kind of reminds me of Vicky because she just said she put on 17 trades, and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, dang, like, I thought I put on a lot, but – I was definitely hesitating compared to Vicky, so we have a lot to learn. Okay, good. Yeah. Very nice. And Lisa? I'm sorry. Um, I wrote um, just you have to have a consistent belief system um, that you just have to um, trust your edge and identify um, market opportunities and then make yourself available to those opportunities um, and then being consistent um, and also thinking in probabilities, accepting the risks. Um, just have uh, just having the correct belief. Yeah. Okay, great. Beauty. Thank you very much, guys, for sharing. So, uh, we're going to go to the round table. Um, firstly, congratulations. Every, everybody's How about verified. Me? Oh, I'm sorry, Anne. Sorry, you. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. <laughs> uh, I actually read the whole book. So, um, I wrote down the, uh, the most important ones were the five fundamental truths. And the seven principles of consistency, which I uh, uh, read every trading day. Uh, but the most important one is uh, on handling conflicts. Um, what I do there is I monitor myself and use the technique of self-discipline to refocus on my objective. I read the five fundamental truths and seven principles of consistency. And I have these in front of me at all times when trading and re repeat them to myself frequently with conviction. Then every time I notice that I'm thinking, saying, or doing something that is inconsistent with these tr truths or principles, I acknowledge the conflict. Uh, don't try to deny the existen existence of the conflicting forces. They are simply part of my psyche that is arguing for the versions of the truth. So that's basically what I learned from the whole book. Okay, good. Very nice. So, yes, uh, going now through to the results and everyone's basically verified. First, the congratulations to everyone who always busy uh, being part of uh, the competition. And the reason for it is the whole purpose of the trading competition, actually, or any type of trading competition, which I always highly recommend to join. Now, the problem about, say, for example, I used to join a lot with my FX, uh, my FX, uh, through my FX something. It's being held by FXCM. Um, I used to compete there quite a lot. Wanda had a competition. Citigroup had a competition. CMC had a competition. So basically for the past decade, I always try to compete as much as I can to see where my edge is. The issue is simply this. Now, with this type of trading competitions, there are no risk management rules. So, anyone so from joining a com com competition by having, say, $500, $1,000, or whatnot, or even a $1,000, $5,000, even a $10,000 competition, is simply, you know, if you have a demo, even on a demo, you have $50,000, they'll give you $50,000, $100,000. There are no set of rules, so the person with the highest return, if you, if you know, they interview the guys, they basically double down, triple down, and uh, in other words, they're putting every everything in their capital because it's free. There's there's nothing that's basically um, that's that they're accountable for. Even a $500 micro competition, and they used to give out like 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, sometimes 5,000. Same thing. Um, at one point, you will see probably the leaderboard, uh, they're all of a sudden like 300%, and then bam, they're out of the competition after like two weeks. Um, the one that I've basically seen, something ridiculous, right? And basically, it's a demo demo account, 
So from a 50,000, all of a sudden he made it all the way to something like 2 million or something like that, something ridiculous. Uh, and the reason is the same. You know, when interviewed, there's no risk management rules. So you know, at least in this competition, you have rules that's being set and only one methodology. So everybody's very consistent. Everybody learned a lot, in my own opinion, from, uh, from the, especially the last two months. Um, if you made a profit simply for two months that you've been trading, man, you've been very consistent. If you've been consistent every week, even better. Now, what really surprised me as well with the results with really good equity curve and it's just cruising um, is Vicky's results. So she ended up with 23.66. So she, fin she finished up really strong at the end from actually at one point it was like six, then five, no, six or eight, right? And it became 10 or 11, then became 16. And then the last was 23.6. So if you see her equity curve, it's just consistent. Um, and ended up with 11.87%. Same thing, very consistent in terms of the equity curve. Um, Samantha came out of nowhere from all of a sudden 3% and finished strong at 8.6%. Uh, Julian at one point was like 9%, 10%, but with one trade, with, because of one mistake, basically gave it away. Micah had a really good one, very consistent very high success rate, like 85% success rate, but with two trades basically gave everything on what he earned. Likewise for Jason. I don't know what Jason's result, but he didn't, he didn't give it to me in the end, but same thing. So I'm going to ask, you know, part of the round table, you know, I'm going to go through first with Vicky, ask questions, you know, with Vicky and how, you know, her experience, what she did how many trades she did for the whole trading competition, ask her success rate, what was her strategy, despite you know success rate around between 70-80%, then what happened with the 20-30. So in other words, she got her losses short. And you know, from what I th thought I actually saw it was almost 100%, but th there's little minor losses, very, very small. So she cuts it very quickly and she had actually more big winners. And this one's also the same. So, um, and then Samantha, Samantha's one's also the same with private equity. So I'm going to go through first with Vicky and Samantha since June's not here. I'm actually recording it so you can also listen. Likewise for Raj is not here. Um, and then ask Mike because uh, Mike, you know, from out of nowhere, I mean Mike, uh, Jason, Jeff, even Samantha, I mean most of most of you guys have never traded before. So, you know, there's some big learning experience through, through here. So I'm going to Meet myself now, and Vicky, it's all yours, okay? So y you guys um, ask questions for Vicky one by one, and here we go. Or maybe before they ask questions, I, I just show them some of the trading information. Please, then, that would be great. Yeah, that's probably don't need to ask that many questions when you see it. Okay, great. Alrighty, yeah. I'll pass the presentation to you, Vicky. Okay, this are the trading information for the whole month. So uh, date entered, date exit uh, by currency pass, how many days I was in that particular trade, uh, whether it's a morning star or evening star, time frame, profit and loss. So in total, I did uh, 38 trades. Uh, with 28 wins and 10 losses. Um, this is the total profit. This is the total loss. Uh, as you can see, actually, there were some very big losses, like here, here, uh, here as well. So those big losses really set me back. Um, so 
in terms of time frames, this were the time frames that I've traded, and by time frames, the number of trades. So I traded more in the longer time frames, and just some of the shorter time frames at, at times when, you know, during class or after class, but I don't normally look at this particular time frames. Um, then by currency pairs, uh, I did majors as well as cross pairs. Um, a lot of the trades were in cross pass. Uh, so, yeah, maybe I should have also concentrated more on the majors as well because the profit is actually quite high on those. Uh, for trade duration, I don't see any, like, um, uh, any evidence that if I hold a trade longer, I would get a higher profit at the moment anyway. I mean, my statistics are very, very little since it's only 38 trades. So, yeah, so th those were the trading information. Great. Who would like to ask a question? Oh, no one? So um, how did you find? Oh, um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go uh, one by one. Right, I'm gonna start then with uh, Samantha. Start, please. Me? Okay. Um, I see that you had like one, two, three, four, five trades in one day. Was that stressful entering that many, or was that, like just fine if you did the set and forget kind of thing? Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I realized that sometimes you have no opportunities at all, and then sometimes things just pop up and they come together. So if you don't take the opportunities, then, you know, that quiet times might come again where you, you just have nothing to trade on. So as far as possible, if I see the opportunities, I would take it, even if it's like five or six trades. So then how did you do like risk management with so many trades at one time? Did you give like a set amount for each one or was it like I'm going to do 10% and spread it all along oh, the... Oh, no, no. I, I used the standard, the 3% for every trade. And for every trade, I would just do three lots. So normally the first two lots is taken out quite quickly and I'm just left with like the last lot to manage. So it's not too bad. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, uh, and your turn, please. That's, that's it. <laughs> so what? Uh, so you just took all trade, uh, all time frames. You didn't have, you didn't choose any time frame in particular that you traded. Um, no, I concentrate mean? on the this week one, day one, H eight, and H four actually. But there were some times when it's so quiet and I have no trades at all that I would then look at like even the smaller time frames and the uh, hit, uh, six hourly. Okay, cool. And yeah. uh, how did you find trading M2? Uh, it's very good actually. I would say that the methodology is quite uh, stable, quite reliable in that if you do see the, the setup, if it's a very good setup, um, very bearish or bur bullish bars and uh, the stochastics is like way oversold and overbought. In most cases, you would you would um, have a win. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Vicky. No All problem. right. Thanks, and Jeff. I don't have questions, but I'm definitely copying down the worksheet there. <laughs> I can send it to Ray and he can send it to all of you if you want. Okay, great. Thank you, yeah. Vicky. Uh, Mike. Yes. Uh, how did you, uh, or I mean, uh, did you find doing the, tr since you did a lot of trades in one day, did you find doing the trading checklist a little stressful? Uh, it is. It is quite uh, tedious because you have to fill in all the limits and the stops. But 
in one day I don't think there was like that many at most like I think at most in one day is five and five I think is still manageable okay and uh, yeah. I know for me when I do it sometimes like it gets kind of tiring you like have like a certain mindset that you pretend you like it doing it so you do it or you just do it <laughs> I think it's uh it's like okay we have to do it for Ray <laughs> and also for me because we have, to, <laughs> we, yeah, we have to keep track of our own limits and the stops and, and and it's a good way I think it's a good way to keep track of all that otherwise we would be writing it down in our trading journals and it's you know it might be less organized but to have it on the checklist, and I just keep it in one folder of M2 Trades checklist, then I can go back and refer to it, and I don't lose track of, you know, what I have committed to uh, at that time of the trade, so that I don't change my limits or stops, you know, as and when. Because if you look at it in a trade journal, and you look at it when the prices change, it might affect you, and you might say, oh, okay, I'm going to change this, and I'll just cancel it out you know, on my trade journal. But to actually go back to the checklist and do the editing, I think that's a bit more of a hassle. And that is at least something that prevents you from doing, you know, the changes, which you shouldn't anyway, because when you uh, plan out on that trade, you, you should follow the limits and stops, as Ray says. Okay, cool. So there is, there is advantage to that, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thanks. And remember, trading is still whether we like it or not a job. So this is your now job as part of your business. Okay. If you if it's tedious for you, hire someone to do it for you. Right. Um, go on Fiverr for five bucks. They'll do it basically for you. So if you don't like it, go for it. You know, hire somebody to do it. It will be part of your management team. If uh, because at the end of the day. If you're not being tedious, what happens, Vicky? Well, not meticulous. Yes. Yeah. And what happens if you are not meticulous? Uh, you'll be a loser. <laughs> exactly. You'll be That's right. <laughs> one of them, one of the parameters doesn't work, especially in the risk management part. You, you see that the probability that you will not win is highly probable. Okay, great. Um, nice. Sarah, do you have any questions, please? Um, I, I don't really know how you work the methods or anything we're at yet, but um, I want to know how we can monitor to set them. Does she never look at them again or until the loss or does she change them once she's set them um, in the last I can't really hear you, Sarah. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I want uh, once you set the the trades, yeah. Do how often do you look at them to monitor them all? Uh, well, I look at them every once in a while because now you can just look at it from your phone or whatever. But I don't do anything as in I I don't like think about oh should I be selling you know the prices is going down or prices is going up should I be taking profits um I'll I'll just let it reach the limits or stops. And that's why you can see such big losses because it hit the limit. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Right, uh, Lisa. Stop. Sorry. Thank you. All right, Lisa, your turn. Um. Okay. So we hit the you um look at the macro and use that as part of your analysis. Yeah, I do look at the macros, um, just to be aware of it. Uh, but you, sometimes the macros actually don't affect the currencies in a big way. So it, you have to just be careful that to kind of differentiate between macros that's going to affect the currency pair that you're trading or just macros that's not going to affect you. Um, but what happened last week was I was also hit by the those big geopolitical things that was happening, and this was what uh, wiped me out when the 
when they had all those problems in the Middle East and the plane crash and uh, yeah, especially in the Middle East. So I think my problem was I was not able to uh, react to those. I should have been like maybe using my intuition more and say, okay, um, this week I have to be careful. Maybe I should reduce. I should sell off two lots and just hold one. But instead I was still holding on to three lots and then uh, things got worse and worse and I, I, I just did nothing. So it just hit my stop and that's it. So yeah, I think macros are important. Great, great. Um, anyone that I missed? Oh, me. Oh, Caitlin, ready. Your turn, please. Um, yeah, so do you, um, how do you trail your stops, and do you have, like, a set way of doing it every time, or, um, you yeah, to actually, that, that is something I want to learn more about as well, because I don't think I'm very good at trailing my stops. Um, the problem is I used to think I should trail it, you know, as close as possible to the current price, because I want to maximize my profits. And I don't want to lose that little bit, you know. But the there was one trade which I found out was that I trailed too close, and then yes, it hit me. Uh, I I got some profits out of it, but then the price continued to you know went the way of the profits. So I could have actually made more profits if I had not trailed that closely. So that is something which I I want to learn a bit more from from Ray because I'm not very good at that. I realize. No worries. I yeah. believe so is everyone else. No problem. So we'll keep a, we'll work on that. No problem. I have one more question to you. Um, yeah. When it comes to your stops, um, do you switch it up every time, or do you have a set rule for your stops as well? Uh, yeah, I use the 15 pip below the current low kind of that that method. Oh, okay. And yeah. so every, every trade you take, you just kind of like just allow it to either hit your stop or to hit your limit? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, I need to start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Great. So if there's one thing that you could uh, recommend or suggest to everyone in the room, Vicky, what would that be? The do's um, and don'ts. Do's and don'ts, I think, okay, firstly, in terms of knowledge, I'm at the same level as everyone. So if all of you were to take the opportunities when they come, you would get even better results than me because I I didn't take like all time frames. So, you know, if you, as what Ray did the other day with just one pair, he came up with like 20 over trades. So if all of you could just take the opportunities with, you know, more time frames, your results would definitely be better than this. And the second thing is that um, I think I need to learn about trade management, uh, which is, we all have the strategy to enter a trade. So we see the setup, we know how to enter it, we set the stops, we set the limits, and we leave it. But that period of leaving it, I believe we should be more active in knowing like when we could uh, cut down our risk. Like for example, when the macro environment is changing, we should be more alert to that and to cut our risk or um, you know, when maybe the environment is improving, we could like add more lots. So things like that. I think I I have a lot to learn on that. Yeah, that that Great. would be my yeah. Awesome. So there it goes. So in other words, in terms of the being aspect, then you need to be confident and just trust in your own ability that when the time to execute, time to execute. Um, that's how you can gain trust, not just. First, you need to trust yourself, then you can trust the system. First, you cannot trust the system by thinking that trusting the system is the opposite way around, right? You need to trust yourself, then when you can trust yourself, then you can trust the system. So it comes from within. If you don't have the trust, everything is that basically a result is a reflection of who we are. And if you need to work on that, then 
definitely work on trust. You might have trust issues or you might have commitment issues. Awesome. Thank you, Vicky. We're going to go through now with Anne. Then from Anne, we'll go with Samantha. And Samantha, we'll go with Mike. And then we'll also go with Caitlin. Right, Anne, your turn. Do you, I will pass the presentation to you and you can explain on your mm -hmm. end on the okay. strategies, what you've done, and so forth. No worries. Okay, with me, I didn't trade a lot, not like Vicky. She traded quite a lot, actually. Um, yeah, so this is my spreadsheet. Uh, I've got a start balance there, and then my end result was 11.87%. I've got my own precision size calculator that I use very quickly, M2 calculator there as well. So I did 14 trades. So um, this is how I record my stuff. And then I put like how much I invested and, and then I, my uh, rate of uh, return on the investment as well, just to, it looks actually good when it's this way. But at the end of the day, it will be the return on your um, initial capital. Okay, so I did all this. I got, um, as you can see here, there's uh, some wins and some losses. I've learned from this one. This one here is that I, um, I was too, uh, I wasn't very objective enough, but at least I cut my losses with this. I learned with that. Uh, my biggest one, my biggest win is actually the um, where is it? The New Zealand, the Kiwi against the US dollar. Actually, rode this, learned how to ride this to um, to the uh, best possible um, pip. So I've, I also record as well how many pips I've uh, accumulated per trade. So I did 14 trades, 11 wins and 3 losses. Now the bigger, the bigger um, losses or these losses here that I've got is um, I wasn't um, objective uh, with uh, my profit taking. That was the issue on those two. Um, I think because of the um, incidents that Vicky was talking about with the, um, the in Malaysia affected those and I got caught as well rather than um, you can already see on the chart that it's going to fall and you're still being I'm, I, I have got my issue on righteousness and I'm, I still want I said okay you know I wanted to win but in the end I uh, it lost I, got, it, I mean it dropped and, and I had big losses on that on those but uh, there were the two main ones but uh, most of the trades were pretty good uh, wins actually so that's how I record and show um, record my um, all my trades, and, and I don't over trade. I just trade uh, what I'm, I feel comfortable. Um, I only focus on uh, 13 currencies, uh, all the majors, and a handful of um, cross pairs. Any questions for me? Right, any questions for Anne? I'll start from bottom to top. So Lisa. Um, so like um, the time frame that you trade, um, do you trade a daily chart? I look at all time frames for M2 from weekly okay. to one hour. Okay, all right. All right, Vicky. Um, that New Zealand US was that New Zealand US where you made two hundred over percent. Yep. Yeah. How do you trail that? Uh, you okay. So yeah. yeah. So what I do is that I move when when T one and T two is taken, I actually move my stop to break even plus the spread, and then oh. if say T two, and then I would um, I either and then I just leave it. Okay, to, and then I just monitor it at the end of the candle or, or at the end of, um, yeah, at the end of the session. So I just do that and then see, and then read the candle. If I can see that uh, a doji happens, then I would close the position because I know that it's stabilizing. It may not continue. It may reverse. So that's what I would do. Okay. All right. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, Sarah. Uh, 
Um, so, these timelines, you would just stick with them until they again reach their stop and their limit? Would you adjust them? No. Uh, once you define your stop loss, because you have, um, you would use the position size calculator to enter how many positions you have uh, based on the stop. Then you, because you're, you've, you've, um, I've identified that I'm happy to have that stop. It's still, of, of course, the low minus the spread or plus the spread. And then once you identify that, then you just stick to that. And then also I use the fib for uh, pro profit taking, and I just stick to that as well. Okay. Okay, uh, Mike. No, that's meticulous. I just want to know if I could <laughs> a copy of that. <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> I'll send it to you as well, to everybody. Okay, cool. Okie dokes. Uh, Jeff. I don't know. I'm just admiring your spreadsheet too. Uh, but, yeah, I don't have any questions because I was really in conference. I was focusing on the learning portion. Alright. Uh, Caitlin. Do you always keep your stop? Sorry, Caitlin. Oh, um, do you always keep your stop at the um low minus the spread? Correct. Or the high minus plus the spread, yes. Oh, okay. How often do you get taken like because of the What was that, sorry? So, um I, g I guess you don't really like it taken out very often. No, um, I find that M2 for me has a 100% success rate. It's up to uh, yourself where you put your profit taking. So if your objective, it will take you, uh, especially when you're with the trend, uh, when you're against the trend, that's when you have to be more 100% objective. Um, so for me, really, all of these trades that I took should have been 100% uh, uh, all profit. It was just me. Um, not, you know, wanting more. Um, n none of these trades were losses. They were, they would have been all, all um, wins, really, at the end of the day. Thank you. And Samantha, thank you, Caitlin. Um, how is your position size calculator different than the one on the checklist? Is it different at all, or...? Uh, no, it's just um, just a quick way for me to look at, um, the, you know, to calculate very quickly rather than going to the checklist. Now, I still have much the checklist, of course, that I, I, I use, um, but I use this for, like, when you look at the setup, you got to act quickly, right? So I just need a calculator that that's there all the time for me to use. So even the M2 calculator, instead of using your calculator, you just put is all programmed or all, you know, it's got all formulas, so you just quickly put the figures in there and then it gives you the trigger straight away and then put it on the chart. Yeah, it's really cool. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Uh, win to lose ratio, and what's your win to lose ratio? Uh, I've got 14 trades, 11 wins, 3 losses. That's um, That's... Uh, 11 so divided by 14. So what's that? About 78% to 78.5. So that's a good um, win to lose ratio. And just imagine you know, in terms of yeah, if everything is basically 100% success rate, it's just simply how to manage mainly the loss is the important factor. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you, Anne. Anyone else that I missed out? Nothing? Going once, twice? All right. Uh, Sa Samantha, your turn, okay? Thanks, Anne. No worries. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I only took three trades. Um, I was being really picky uh, with the ones I chose, and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm being like, you know, smart about it. But I think missing out on opportunities, I could have made a lot more. Um, I don't know. Basically, like I 
didn't micromanage them at all. I just like let them do their thing. Um, and with this one, though, this is the only one I micromanaged, the EFD uh, Japanese yen. When I saw it hit this doji, um, and like I, I had some weird feeling about it, and that's the only time like intuition kind of kicked in, and I got out before it started um, going down. I didn't have a final picture for this one, but um, yeah, mostly it was just uh, being patient and being really meticulous and like not are trying to be as objective as possible because for me if there's any subjectivity I freak out <laughs> and can sabotage myself so if I feel like everything's done the way it's supposed to and it's like on the checklist and I push the button everything's fine I don't um, micromanage but if I let any subjectivity come in that's when my like psychology gets the best of me and yeah but also um, I think my one problem is I didn't uh, risk a lot. I know for like a competition, you should probably like uh, maybe up the ante, but I was just doing like more realistic, um, I guess, percentages for me because I kind of got burned off my first trade, but now I'm slowly increasing my percentage and getting more comfortable. And yeah, so I don't know. All right. <laughs> I don't have a spreadsheet. I wish no. I did. <laughs> Problem. Very nice. So he's being selective three trades. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how many trades you're going to make, to be honest. Um, even with one trade alone, you can trade with just with one pair. Um, you can make basically the biggest amount that you can ever make. Right. So excellent. Really good things that you've stated there. Being meticulous, being patient. Very nice. Any questions for Samantha? I'll start from top to bottom this time. Okay, I'm going to start from Caitlin. I don't really have any questions. Nothing. All right, great. Anne? Yeah, how, so how did you find trading the M2? Um, I liked them. They weren't stressful at all to me, except I traded one that really burned me in the past, so I didn't. That's why I wasn't putting a lot of like percentage on, because I put 10% <laughs> on the Euro USD, and it mm -hmm. totally bit me. And um, yeah, so I was kind of like antsy and like worried about it, so I was putting like 1%, I think, on my other trades. But for this one, I put a whopping 2%. So exciting! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, uh, I like them. They were fun. Okay, great. Uh, Jeff? Uh, no questions, but great job, Sam. Thank you. Mike? Likewise, no questions. Good job. Excellent. Sarah? Uh, um, any of the USD Japan or just... And you are USD, like, they were just major ones you you found or you just stick to those do you? Um, I usually just stick to the majors but I did um, did the odd New Zealand and it, I wouldn't have found it unless someone else in the class pointed it out because I usually don't look at them. Um, I don't know why I just usually just look at the majors um, maybe because like the US dollar kind of helps me out but yeah two of them were majors one of them was the uh, cross Right, cool. Great. Uh, Vicky? So are you going to trade more now? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I definitely am because I was being really, really selective on which ones I chose, but I think that was more of like a fear factor involved. Like I was being overly choosy when um, I think I could have either like totally decreased my position size if I wasn't sure about it, but I definitely don't get in as much as I should. So I can use it as an excuse, like, oh, I'll find the perfect one and, like, wait for it. <laughs> but you have to, like, take the opportunities that come to you anyway. So. Okay. Okay, yep. very nice. And last but not least, Lisa. Um, okay, so I know you said you only traded the daily chart. So is that what you did for this competition? Um, I believe so. Let me see. They... Yeah, it was all, oh, one was weekly, but it, it took me out, out, out like day two, and I didn't know about it. I was like, oh, I'm going to wait till Friday to check it. And then I was like, wait, hold on. 
took me out already. So, yeah, mostly just the day chart because I don't, I feel that if I, I don't know, just for me, I like to set it and completely walk away. And for some reason, when I feel like I have a four hour or like a, a one hour, it's too neurotic for me. Like I have to like check more than I, sh I don't know. It's probably just psychological, but I think the day I like to set it and like walk away and see what happens like every day versus be at my computer a lot, checking it out. So it just helps me not micromanage. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if that helps. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anyone else? Uh, that's pretty much it, right? Great. Thank you very much, Samantha. Last but not the least, we're going to go with Mike. Okay, sorry, Mike and then Caitlin. Hello, Mike. You still there? Hello. Unless you're Sorry muted, about Mike. My mic. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. So in this conversation, I um I entered twenty nine trades. I'm still in one. Um, out of those twenty eight trades that I closed, four of them were losses. Two of them last week, which were major losses, and um yeah i I believe them to use a great um method, especially I like going against the trend. I try to use all time frames and try to take every opportunity presented to me and uh I guess the lessons I learned and it's a constant learning process as each trade I took, um, but you have to be really selective more, or at least I have to be more selective in taking certain M2 trades like Sam did, but a little more than three trades. But other than that, uh, I like, I enjoyed the competition, um, especially trading for my, for the first time. Um, feel pretty proud of myself. Any questions? Awesome. Okay, so from bottom to top, Lisa. Um. Going mm. once, twice. Nothing. Um, no questions. Alrighty, uh, Vicky. So do you like M2, Mike? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Uh, Samantha. Um, so you said you take trades against the trend. How many did you uh, take against the trend in all of the ones during the competition? I still have to make that chart because, um, like, Vicky and Anime, but. I most of them were against the trend, so there's uh the recent ones that I remember that were with the trend was the weekly, the the dollar against the CAD, but I didn't take too many with the trend. I like one against it. Okay. All right, beauty. Uh, Sarah. Hello, uh, Sarah. Yep. Hi. Yeah. Um, no, I've got no questions. Right. No questions. Jeff. I have a quick question. So, why do you want to go against the trend when your probability of winning is higher if you want to go with the trend? Because it's all about when you exit. So, obviously, it's going to... It's you know, M two evening star or morning star is a reversal pattern, so it's a quick profit before it continues to go against you, so it's an easy money. 
my opinion. Isn't it, isn't it easier money to go with trends? It is, but I like the challenge of just going against the trends. So how was your risk management going against the trend? Um, 10%. <laughs> no further questions. Your Honor. Okay, no problem. Uh, Caitlin. Can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I don't know, the mute button, like, just disappeared. Um, what was I going to say? I was like, I, I can't see what you mean, though, because, like, if you go against the trends, then, like, it's really just a no-brainer when you're going to get out. You make some money, and then you get out, because you can't expect it to go anymore. So I see what you mean. All right, and okay, Mike. Uh, what did you learn about yourself from being in the comp? Um, to be honest, that I could, I'm, I have the, uh, how do you say this? Uh, basically, I have, I have the, <laughs> I have the, I have the balls to trade. So, because I didn't ask when I took those two losses, I didn't react the way. Um, some people, aka my brothers, reacted when they lost it. I actually, right. I actually, it actually, <laughs> I don't know. It, it in a way, it kind of helped me build a passion into learning more about trading and further my learning into this. And that passion inside is it's, it's increasing. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, and then Lisa is uh, just remembered. Okay, so Lisa, question. Uh, I was going to ask, how do you um, determine your targets when you're against the trend? Uh, supply and demand and fibs. Fibs will give me a clear picture of where it where it has a possibility of touching, but once I put my supply and demand levels, I have a better picture of where I can get out. But, yeah. In the, in the two trades last week I made, I just, I kind of was experimenting and um, just wanted to see if it, I was experimenting. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Excellent. Any other questions? None? Then we'll I'll pass it on to Caitlin. Oh, but I like um lost money in the comp. It doesn't matter, right? So you were you were one of them who um who basically traded as part of the, or competitor of the competition, and people can still learn from your mistakes, right? So, uh, for me, at the end of the day, yeah, the the results, like the results are there, but the major part is what did you learn? So, if you could share what you learned, that would be awesome. Okay. Um. So I wrote down all the things that worked and all the things that didn't. And then it came to the comp, and the things that didn't work was that in the in the beginning, um, I lost like a lot of money, um, because, and it's sad because like literally it hit like my target, but I was just greedy and thought it would go up more, so it went back down, and then I ended up losing money, and then I was in denial and it just kept going down, and then I had to finally get out, and that's basically what happened to me for like half of the competition, um. Yeah, like, see here, like, um, man, there's one where I've lost a lot of money. See, I would have made money if I would have trailed my stock. But then, like, um, eventually I ended up trailing it. So when I made an amount that I was happy with, I um, moved my stop up. And if it went up, awesome. I never did. Oops. Hello. I don't know why, but I thought um, that I could um, put, like, a lot of positions on to hit the first target. 
and then make a lot of money, I thought. But actually, that doesn't work because you have to buy all those positions. And then, like, if you it only goes a short way, it's not going to, like, be able to pay for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> that was another mistake I made that I will never make again. Um, yeah, and, they, and also, you know what? I, like, um, kind of, like, micromanage my trades. I need to just set it and forget it and accept what happens. Because... All these trades are very stressful. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way, apparently, because that's not how Anna and Ricky trade. So, um, that's what I learned. Excellent. Okay, so questions for Caitlin, please. I'll, I'll start from the top. And um, did you enjoy trading M two? Yeah, I actually did. Like, even though I was like losing a lot of them, I still had a lot of hope. <laughs> and, like, and like I enjoyed getting in I, I liked it it's like really exciting finding a setup so what would you change um, is it more about yourself that you will change mindset yeah maybe? yeah my goal um, from now on is to literally just set it and forget it instead of I, I don't know I thought I had some kind of control over it like oh if I'm watching it all the time then like I can get out like before it goes against me and like save money but I don't know it's kind of a neurotic way of thinking and if you have like five trades on at the same time it's just not very pleasant and um yeah I just think I just need to like trust my edge and cause like yeah like what I learned is that most of the trades I put in like they touched my targets I just didn't want to take them off cause I wanted to make more money mm -hmm. and um yeah Awesome. Nice, thank you. And Jeff, your turn, please. Yeah, so what's like the big thing you learned? I mean, like, um, was it more just to be more relaxed and just trust the system? Because uh, I know you mentioned that it hit all your target points, but did you put a limit on when you place your, your trades, or did you uh, try to control when you want to get out? You know, exactly like your yeah, that's like the thing. I thought that it would, um, I don't know, it seemed like it was going pretty strong and like, I was like, why should I take off, you know, positions now at T1 if I can take them all off later and make more money? Yeah, I basically just let greed take over. So I like moved my limit. I was always lo moving my limits all the time. <laughs> it's out of control. I just need to like set it and drink it. So you probably would have won all these trades if you would have just said, yeah. okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, basically, that's what I learned, yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mike? How did you uh, control your emotions? Mm. Your losses? Um... I think what happened, well, I don't know, like, whenever I lost, I was usually, like, pretty relieved that, um, I got out, you know, that I got out, because usually they kept tanking, and I was like, oh, sh shoot, dude, like, I would have lost so much more money, so, um, I don't know, I guess I just kind of go into denial mode after I have a loss, like, okay, whatever, next one, um, yeah, I, I wasn't, like, crying or anything, but, like, I don't know, I just, I'm, I remained optimistic and <laughs> kept putting trades in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, alrighty, uh, Samantha. Oops, hello, hello, Samantha. Samantha, I think you're on mute. <laughs> oh, I noticed. Since I'm your sister, <laughs> and you know, share the same room, you're always on. Oh, we, uh, I don't know about okay. everyone else, but you missed it. <laughs> you were cutting there for a second, uh, Samantha. What was that? Sorry. Hello. Oh, man, you're like totally cutting out, Sam. Yeah. Sorry, Sam. You were cutting out. Hello? Hello? There you go. Hello, Samantha. Samantha, maybe Hello. you can hear Yeah, there you go. 
Can you can hear me now? Yes. Sorry, what was that, please? Can you say it again? Okay, hold on. Okay. 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 Since I'm your sister, Caitlin, and I live in the same room as you, I see you on your computer at all hours of the day, like nonstop checking trades. Um, even though it's a good thing you, because you find setups, do you think you find setups that aren't ideal and you click the button anyway because you want to trade? No, I don't, Samantha. <laughs> Is that denial? <laughs> I'm not in denial, Samantha. I only choose the best of trades, and I only choose them if they're going with the trend, or I see room for them to go up a little bit to do trend down analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I micromanage them, but I think I get into good trades if I see a setup that I take it and like you. <laughs> Ladies, ladies, relax. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You're a little competitive. <laughs> awesome. Very nice. Uh, Vicky, your turn, please. Yeah, so it looks like, Caitlin, you actually recognize or analyze the setups correctly, but it's just that you micromanage and things went bad, right? Yeah. So... That's, that's a good thing, isn't it? Because you then know that, okay, if you don't micromanage it as much late, uh, uh, from now on, all these trades are going to be profitable. Yeah, like I had like an immense fear of just like letting it go. Yeah. Like, I just need to let that go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know when, uh, I'm not telling you, like this is basically in general, you know when you guys are in a relationship and then it's not working right? You just have to let go. Just like, sorry, this relationship is not working. You got to go. You, gotta, you know, you have to learn how to let go. But if it's good, then boom. You know, you, you have to hang into it because maybe that person will be the right one. So you have to hang on with that person. But if it's no longer good, you guess to get away, right? Awesome. Beauty. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, did you take nine trades altogether? Um, I took ten trades. Ten trades. Or, oh, no, was it nine? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was nine. Yeah. All right. So, do you think next time you'd take more or less? I'm going to take more next time. Um, well, I don't know. I thought I took a lot, but apparently not compared to other people. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think just from like what I was reading and trading in the zone and what I heard Vicky and Anne say is like you just want to take every setup that you see because the more you take, the more probability you have of you know having more that like work out. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna definitely take more trades, and I think it'll be easier to take more trades if you kind of like just set your limit and your stop and just let it do its own thing and not yeah. micromanage them. Before, I kind of didn't want to have, like, too many going at the same time because I got too much to, you know, if you're micromanaging them like I do, it's just too much. Yeah, that's my problem, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got that on that one. <laughs> right, that was good. You did good. Beauty. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Lisa. Mm, so, like, when you micromanage, do you, like, move your... Um, target or stop loss? Yeah, I do. So, like, if I see that it's, like, moving up a lot, I will, like, uh, I'll think, oh, I can totally make more money. My first target is, like, way too low, so I, like, move it up, and then it won't touch it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm just constantly moving my limit and my stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Beauty, thank you. Did I miss anyone? No. Uh, in actual fact, there was another person who was in the competition. It's Lisa. So Lisa came back in the end, too. So uh, Lisa, if you could also share your experience, that would be awesome. Actually, just uh, above breaking even, so which is awesome. Okay. Um, actually... I thought the competition ended earlier, 
but apparently it didn't. Um, sorry, I don't have the trades right now. Okay, no problem. Just share then what you learned from the competition, and then still basically gonna ask each individual for questions. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, so one of the trades that I lost on is the your USB trade. I took that one. Um, well, I just noticed like a lot of times when you have an M2 ahead of news, like news tends to take you out, and then it might go in the direction of your trade later on. But then you would ha have been taken out. So, um. Yeah, just be careful when the macro environment changes. Um, I didn't really take that many trades, so probably should have looked more. Okay, no worries. How many trades did you do for the three weeks of the comp? Because uh, you were, you thought that it was ended actually the week before that. Um, I took. Three trades. Three trades, great. Um, within those three trades, how many wins, how many losses? Uh, two losses. Two losses, one win. Okay. Right, so question time now for uh, Lisa. I'll start from the bottom. Uh, Vicky, please. So would you take more trades now, Lisa? Um, yeah, that's, my, that's the plan. Okay, good. Um, Samantha. Uh, hello, Samantha. Unless you're muted. I have to go to another room. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're waiting for Samantha. Um, Sarah. Oh. Hello, Sarah. Oh, hello, sorry. Yep. Questions for Lisa. Oh, um, oh, no, sorry, no questions. No questions. Okay, Mike. Do you like M2? Yeah, I like it. I like the, um, I just like the concept of it, I guess. Okay, great, Jeff. So, do you like M3s better than M2s? Um, M3. I feel like every time um it hits my stop on the M3, it takes like a huge chunk of your profit, or my profit anyway, because M3. Um, when I traded it, I didn't leave the, the last unit to trail, so all of my trades were taken out very quickly. And um, when I when it does hit my stop before it hits my target, um, there's uh, the loss is usually bigger than the win, so it feels very weird. Overall, I think it's a winning strategy just um is a bit different than M twos. So the risk management is more controllable with the M two I think. Mm, yeah. I feel that way. Cool, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um Mike. Oh I already asked you. Oh, I'm sorry. You did? Okay, sorry. Uh, Caitlin. Well, actually, I don't really have any questions. Mm. No questions, and Yeah, I just uh, curious, why only three trades? Because, um, well, um, I think it's a psychological thing that if I just look in the past to see if they work, then I will know and I don't have to actually trade it. So I was being, um, 
always be in action or um, I wasn't taking action. I was just kind of being passive and kind of visually back testing them. So um, does that mean that you didn't believe in the method? Hmm. I think I just didn't, um, I didn't know about, or I wasn't familiar with the VIB, um, being that objective, so uh, I was kind of scared of being subjective, and so I didn't take that many. Okay, so will you improve on that then? So will you approach myself or maybe Ray to, um, you know, get help in that section, that area, because it seems like you didn't trust the method. I trust it now, seeing like the results and like doing, especially like um, looking for those M2s in the past month on the, like the Excel sheet thing that we did. Yeah. Um, good enough. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Beauty. Thank you. And if Samantha's still there? Yes. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Lisa, please? Uh, yeah. What time frames did you focus on, or do you find yourself focusing on when you play trade? Four, four hours. Four hours. Awesome. Thank you. And. Great. Any other further questions for Lisa? Did I miss anyone? Uh, none. So um, I know I went over time and I actually did it on purpose. I'll just do this as part of the beginner's session because it's going to be important for the beginners because once they get into the intermediate, at least they would know what to expect. Right? And um, if you haven't finished your Excel spreadsheet, please make sure to do so. There was actually your homework over the weekend. It's currently now Monday. It's actually now Tuesday, so you're way overdue. But if you look into that, right, your pound US dollar, I don't know who did the pound US dollar, I believe this is Mike, you say 88%, dollar Swiss, 70 and a half, um, dollar CAD, 89.47. Uh, pound yen, 69 and a half. Dollar yen, uh, I don't know who did dollar yen, so someone has to do the success rate on that. Euro yen, uh, 73. Yen, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just please fill out the success rate. For the dollar yen, you can see actually from uh, daily. Six hours, nothing in the eight hours, four hours, a lot of wins. Only two losses out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And that's actually a pretty big success rate right there. So out of how many trades? That's 30 minus 2, 28. There's uh, two losses, 28, 26. Let's do the quick calculation. 26 divided by 28. Bingo. Wow. So 92.3. All right. Um, Euro yen, 73.17, and of course what we did last time is 82.14. So e there are a lot of trades right there, right? A um, lot of opportunities. Now your homework actually is going to be very simple. Based on today's class, what are two or three things that you learned from everyone, including from yourself during this competition? The next competition is going to be in September. So they're going to start September 1st, which is a Monday. Uh, since August is pretty dull, so you can use that as a practice. Um, so September 1, it is going to be just two methods, method 2 and method 3. I'm going to also going to be part of the competition. I just want to see as well on how I could pan out with the rest of you. 
So same rules will apply with both two methodologies, same setups, same rules of 10% uh, for US-based and 4% for non-US-based because of your leverage, uh, leverage abilities that you can go all the way to uh, 0.2 of a percent of a margin, pretty much like 500 to 1. So um, it will give it a little, you know, a little bit more of an edge on your end. Uh, but uh, yeah, two methodologies, very simple, method two and the method number three. Um, and then see how far you can go from there. All right, any questions for me or for anyone else before we wrap it up? Oh, I have a question for you about the homework. Yeah. Um, did you get mine? I think it was the Euro USD. Did that one? Uh, no, it should actually automatically be put in here. So let me refresh it. Euro USD. Uh, I think I've kind of like added it on someone else's um, spreadsheet on, on the accident. one that James sent. Okay. Was, yeah, I don't know if I. Is that the same one? Because it, it was an 88%. Okay. Oh, um, nope. Um, nothing. Sorry, sorry, Samantha. Nothing in there. Oh no! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dang, that took forever. Okay. Okay. Um. So it should be still on your end. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's so. I guess it was like on the um on that spreadsheet thing and then I just there was a whole bunch of pairs on there. There was like two different currencies and I just added mine to the bottom. Oh. And I don't know if that was obviously incorrect, but um this one here? Okay, this one right here? Or is it Japanese yen? Um no or I just Euro. Euro I was a Euro thing? US dollar, yeah. Oh, oh, sweet. oh yeah. Okay, here, here we go. Yeah, sorry, okay. I just like added it to Oh, okay. I didn't see that they were tabs. <laughs> I don't know. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, there you go then. Uh, so there's in there. And it's just a matter of I'll do the okay, eighty eight point eight nine. And then there is one on the bottom, Aussie Japanese yen. Who did the Australian Japanese yen? Um, that was me, I'm still working on it. Okay. Not a problem. Great. Thank you very much. I um, hope you guys enjoyed it today and I always learn something new. And if there's then no questions, we're going to wrap it up. And um, I will move to the beginner's class. I just let this recording just keep going. All right, guys. If you want to stay, great. If you don't want to stay, no problemo as well. We'll just have a quick uh, break, okay, Sarah? Probably like one or two minutes and then we'll hit back to the trends. Okay, thank okay. you. Right. Thank, thank you. you guys. Uh, Good one. Well done guys.
Okay, uh, hello Sarah, if you're there, let me know. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Hello, Lisa. Hello. I mean, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. You there, Sarah? Hello. No worries, Sarah. No worries at all.
Hello. Hi, Sarah. How are you Hi. doing? Good. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, not a problem at all. She's doing everything tonight. <laughs> <laughs> totally We've understand. Got Japanese student coming next week. So. Oh, wow. Awesome. So much for that. Yeah. Gotcha. I wish you had that candlestick. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so did you like <laughs> did you like today's <laughs> session, Sarah? Really good. Really okay. good. good. Very interesting to see. You know, like the winners were just setting a trade and forgetting it. <laughs> 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 Which was really good to see. Good. That's my problem. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, really good. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're I'm gonna pass the presentation to you. Let me have a look in terms of what you know so far. because um, we did trends, correct, last week? Um oh with the looking at the um the charts. Yeah, like in looking terms of trends. Um so we only covered up the candlesticks, we haven't covered trends yet. Um Oh, it's computers, and I put notes on the other one. Sorry. Okay. Um, what did you cover with, uh, what has Harry covered with the uh, Monday, Wednesday one? Uh, he hasn't done Monday this week. Yes, oh, last week, I mean. Oh, no. I didn't go. How about last I Thursday, or Thursday, or Wednesday, your time? Uh, I, I didn't go. Oh, okay, that's Wednesday. right. Cause you I, I, I couldn't. Make it that Wednesday, uh, and um, I haven't really been. I've only been a couple of times to Harry's. Okay. And so basically, but last week with me, what did we cover so far? What did you learn? Um, so we looked at the. I'll just cover me. Sorry. Hello, Ray. Oh, hi, Sarah. Yep. Oh, yeah, I found it. Sorry, I put it in a different place than all the other ones. I found it. No problem. <laughs> but, 
that we were talking about um, the peaks and the troughs. Yes. And the the thirds of the candle. Yes. And um, uh, about being objective, the candles. Okay. Good. Um. All right. So let's. Uh, I will go through then. I'm going to pass the presentation to you. Open up your uh, FXM platform, and then um, demonstrate on how to find the peaks and the troughs. Okay. So um, I will oh, pass the pass and print. Here we go. No problem. Hello, Ray. Ah, uh, yes. Um, can you resend that share? Sure. Window? It seems to have vanished. Okay, there you go. Oh, yeah. So, um, in order to find a trough, mm -hmm. um, we're looking for a lower low in three in a row. So one is higher than lower than higher. So, um, okay. So let's do this. Uh, if you can do me a favour, please. Um, Remove the moving average for me for now. Okay, so let um, firstly start from the current candle, and then go one and backtrack one after the other, and then define if you see like a like a roof or hat formation and then a V formation. Uh, so this candle is, is a bearish candle, mm -hmm. um, and next to it is a, a doji, a very small, do you say that's still a doji? It's got a mm -hmm. tiny body. It's okay. one third bigger tail than the body. I mean it's um, two times mm -hmm. bigger. Right, then I look into um, the, the highs and the lows. So th the high of the current candle, is it higher or lower compared to the previous candle? The, the present bearish candle is current. higher high than the, the, the second one, one before, okay. and then the one before is lower. So the highs are showing an uptrend, okay. higher highs. And this carries on to the next candle. But the candle before that is a higher high. Yeah. So from the high of that to the one in front, that could have indicated a lower, a lower, a low trend. Mm -hmm. So a lower it's high, okay. A lower high. Mm -hmm. um, um, but there's not much strength in the body much force because it's not one third of the the distance between the high and the low. Okay, so uh, in terms of just the highs and the lows alone, um, is there a confirmed peak? Um, 
Well, no, because... Well, this was a peak, but because yes. that didn't continue to a low, it hasn't become a peak. So this last candle may be the peak. Okay. If it's gone to bear, it's the next candle to follow bear. Okay, so we're going to uh, find peaks and troughs. Okay. So since the current candle is not confirmed peak as yet, um, where was the last peak? Um... There was a peak at this doji from this. Okay. You're too far, right? So there's one um, more that's recent. Yeah, good. Nice. Oh, so let's. Uh, okay, yeah. Exactly. So uh, use your circle tool or your square box tool okay, just to identify that. Okay, great. Just so that one. Okay. Correct. So there is a peak on that. Oops. How do I grab it? Oh, yes. okay. there you go. Beautiful. <laughs> and then let's define as well the trough. Where was the trough? Or oh, where is the trough? Oh, here as well, same Great. candle. Great, all right. It's on the same candle. And how how do you know, or how would I know, that that is the actual trough? Because it's the lower... Oh, I'm not really good at moving this. How do you do this? Move it. Uh, oh, can you it. Yes. Pull on. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it's had higher highs, higher lows, sorry, and then it reached a lower, a lower low, and okay. then went back to a higher low. Okay, great. All right, then from there, where is now the next trough or peak um, in the past? So if you're backtracking, yeah, if you're backtracking now. Um, this doji. Yep, excellent. All right, and then I'll put a uh, circle one there too. That one's very small, but is that counted? It's not not enough in there. Uh, before you find there, then there's a now the peak. You have to find where the next peak is. Oh, um, peak will be that one. Okay, great. Okay, and where is either the next peak or the next mm -hmm. trough? That's very slight. I don't know if that's counted, is it? If it's just okay. Um, since the human eye is not as accurate, how can we be objective? I can do the line underneath. Uh, no, nope. there's an easier, there's an easier one. Yes, okay, you, you did. So, if you left click it, you will see the open high and the oh. low close, right? Oops. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the close was. Oops. Oh. Oh no. What left click? Yeah. Um. Seven five zero three seven. And ninety four nine five five and ninety four nine five four. So. 94954 is lower than 94555, right? Is that yeah. sorry, 94955, yeah. And, 94955. Yep. 94954. So that is slightly higher. By 0.001 of a pip. Oh, yeah. So we don't count that then. <laughs> <laughs> no? That will be your low, exactly. You, even with a 0 0.0001 of a pip, of a difference. Yeah. Oh. And so that definitely is now your trough. But there is one in between that also created a peak. This that one, one. Yeah, exactly. So you can also double check it through. Oh, yeah. um, so the high was 
Correct. So, Trough is that one. And there's one before that as well, right? Yep. Same one, same one. Good. Oops. I do that one to go with that one. They have to go in pairs, do they? I'm sorry? Do they go in pairs? Like the high and the low? Or? Uh, yeah. As long as they will form the peak and the trough. Sometimes it can happen in one uh, one candle or candle. one bar. So this one is the peak of. Yes, correct. This oh, this, this one is actually. Exactly. That's also yeah. a peak. Okay. Carry on, or? Yes, please. We'll do all the way to 1807 at 1700. Okay. So that. Get that one up to fit. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Hi, Raj. Hello. Hi, Raj. Hello. Can you hear us, Raj? Yeah. 
You can still hear me, right, Sarah? Yeah, I can okay, hear you. Okay, okay. Hello, Raj. Hello. Okay, very nice. See now that you can you can identify the peaks and the troughs now that it's is that 100% objective or subjective? Objective. Exactly. So now I want you to change the, uh, uh, if you go to the top one right there next to the currency pair Aussie Japanese Yen, change H1, uh, next to H1, go towards, if you click H1, and then there's about 20 days or something, or two days. If you go scroll down to one hour for me, please. So say so one hour. Uh, yeah, one hour. Go through, go towards one hour. Okay, keep going, keep going, please. And oh, no, towards your left. Yeah. Oh yeah. One hour. Yep. And then click five days. Five days. Yes, please. So five days is simply how many? How based on one hour? Um, notice how you moved it, right? Um, in one day, how many? candles are there? How many one hour in one day? 24. 24. Uh, if two days, then you have how many? 48. 48. If you have five days, then how many do you have? Uh, 140. 140. Excellent. Right. So go go back again, please, by default. Oh. Um, yeah. So the rule is that if you want to have a uh, looking at the chart, if you're scrolling it to the left, you're scrolling to the right, and you're skewing it, at least you would need to have by default is around 96 candles and above. Alright. Right. Like since on a one hour, four hours, you're like you're talking here about either 10 days or 20 days. For a daily chart, you're looking here at least a minimum of three months and then six months, then one year, and so forth. So we're going to identify, since you can identify the peaks and the troughs, we're going to go through and look into how to draw your trend lines. To draw an uptrend is through using the, the troughs, and the downtrend is using the peaks. Hi, Raj. Can you hear us now, Raj? Oh, right. I can hear you now. I don't know what went wrong before. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, before I go uh, go ahead, Sarah, uh, Raj, up to where did you get at with um, Harry last week? Oh, last week. Um, sorry. No problem. I just came here. No worries. Since Harry is uh, uh, traveling, my goal is actually just even just to spend um, extra, but just half an hour during the psychology session. Is simply I'm going to cut it basically in half. So just to see where both of you are at. Uh, since we are on the right track anyway with uh, the trading psychology, is I can only spend more time with technical analysis. Okay. Did you cover about trends last week? Trends. Or you only I'm covered? I don't have a member, right? Sorry. Okay. Alright, not a problem. Alright, so uh, Sarah, would you mind explaining on your own words, based on what you're doing here, how to define a peak and a trough to Raj, please? Okay. So you just continue where you left off. Okay, so we've got um, a 
a heart a peak which is a sequence of three candles and the middle candle will be a higher high than the previous the left and the right candle so it makes like an upwards V shape so these candle, these circles that have been marked are showing the peak within these three candles next to it. And then the trough is the lower low of the three candles together. So making that kind of V shape. And again, that's showing the lowest lower low of the previous and the one in in front of the candle above. Uh, lower low. Do you understand what I mean? <laughs> Does that make sense? Hello? Yes, I'm listening. Does that make sense? Uh, a little bit. I don't think I have covered this topic, so maybe I need to go one more. Tell me again one more time. So a peak is we're looking at in the three candles. So, see the one I'm on now? Can you see my screen? Yeah. 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 So, the one I'm the, the shape that I'm on now, this mm -hmm. high yeah. is higher than the previous candles high and the candles afterwards high. That's showing a peak. And then a trough, trough is the lowest, the lower oh, okay. low of the three candles, the one before and the one after. So it's like a V shape is for your top okay. and then you've got an a reverse V for your peak if you could imagine drawing a line. Not always a very neat V, but it's a V. <laughs> yeah. And we've got ninety six well, we've got ninety more than ninety six candles, but um May was just saying you should work on about ninety six candles in in your chart. So whatever that might be on a one hour five days or more than five days. Well, it makes more than five days, and then for your your day, it should be about three months of candles showing on the chart. Okay, so we're always looking one before and one after, is it right? Yes. So that's so where these ones on the top, that's showing the peak of the, those three together. Yeah. Okay. So Sarah, where do you start finding the peaks and troughs from? Starting from left to right, or starting from the current all the way to the left? I'll start from the current candle, the most recent, and work backwards. Okay, so if you could just now demonstrate um, where you left off, how you find the next peak and then the next trough. So I've just done this peak here, and sometimes it's the same candle that creates the trough too. So in this case, uh, oh, it's not in this case, sorry. So this is a downward trend. So this, these are all going lower, lower, lower. And that's that's lower still. So they won't be. So keep going through. Well, that that is a this one here would be a trough because this one before is much higher, and this one before is just slightly higher. So even though it's a little, is it not? It's a bigger difference. That's still tough. And then with this one, that's again. This would be this one here because the one before is higher. The middle one is lower. The one before that is higher. So that's a trough. And then here you would have a peak. because you've got the one here is lower high this is a higher high and then this one is a lower high that would make your peak and they generally come in and in the pair peak and trough together is that right? Okay, good, there's one more to your right uh, would it be that one? Yeah. 
for that one. That one you meant? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oops, sorry, I should skew that. Can I keep going or? Uh, one more, please. A couple more. Uh, uh, and then let me just go through a little bit uh, to share with Raj before. I'll just keep going then, shall I? Yes, please. A couple yep. more. Uh, right here last week with Harry, um, last Wednesday, uh, he covered with me candlestick. How okay. you recognize what's um, dodgy or shooting style, dragonfly, all that? Okay, good. All right. Okay. Nice. Oh, I've got my notes now in front of me. Okay, excellent. Okay, good. There you go. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Okay, uh, let me just go just a quick one right here. Um, So uh, after the last session, because um, I told Harry that uh, to go through now with the, with the basics of technical analysis, simply with um, you know uh, Doji, the bullish bar, bearish bar, and then from there the progression is identifying trends, or type of trends, and the hierarchy of trends. Um, so. If simply a trend will be dictated only two two types of trends, simply an uptrend or a downtrend, where an uptrend is a series of higher highs and a series of higher lows, meaning that if I will take uh, a bullish candle, for example, if we just basically compare it with the high and the low. So before I actually do that, it's really imperative to know um, the, t oh, the components or variables of how candlesticks are being formed. So there's always going based on time. There's always going to be an open, a close, a high, and a low. If we're going to know the players of the game. The players of the game are the following, based on hierarchy, the top of the food chain is still going to be your institutions. Then you have your hedge fund managers, you have your professional traders and professional retail traders, and then you have your retail traders, and on the bare bottom, I call them the bottom feeders, they're your normal mind paths. Now, in my input, traders are mainly investors who are simply, they're not educated and simply enough to know about trader investing, but they're the ones who listen to business news, CNBC, reading Wall Street Journal, or any type of uh, the business section, and also listening from their brokers. Um, though they are what we define them as the normal mind paths. Retail traders, they're not as bad. They're trying to get educated and they're the one who's learning by themselves. But they're still getting basically at a uh, very expensive price. Retail price points. Professional retail traders are the ones who have a little bit more knowledge and have the skill set to define where institution traders are compared to retail traders. So that's what they're actually in between. But they're getting as much as they can close to a price at a wholesale price where either hedge fund manager institutional price points are. 
Institutional price points, simply they create the price. Hence, they will have the advantage and they will have the manufacturer's price. Manufacturer price. So it's like compared to a business, manufacturing price will only happen when you are the creator of the product. So you go to either Asia, Mexico, or any place that will basically do your product for almost free at a very cheap price, and then the manufacturer will sell it to the wholesaler. Wholesaler will sell it to the retailer, and the retailer will, will sell it mainly to another retailer. So that's how simply how they work in terms of the players. So they go in hierarchy, manufacturer goes, sells it to, to the wholesalers, wholesaler sells it to the retailers, retailer sells it to the bottom one, right, the retail, retail. So in other words, a retail, retail business is someone who's buying products from eBay or Amazon and they're going to sell it again on eBay or, na or Amazon for a small amount of money. So this is why around this segment is a lot of inconsistencies and mainly losses. And the reason being is just really, let's like really think about it, that when price goes up, someone would have must have bought it here at the bottom. If someone is buying over the here, if they bought it at a very cheap price and the manufacturer basically got everything for, say, $1 and accumulated, say, 20000 when there's 20000 that has been accumulated, that's been basically bought, they have to sell it now and hence the price will continue. Once information has been sort of leaked out and a valuation will occur, they need to value that certain asset class, doesn't matter, will be BHP, NAB, a currency pair, a futures index like ASX or the Dow or the VIX or sorry, the S&P and they need to value that. So how the valuation is being dictated is through is what we stated is through an economist who will give a certain value that the value of this is say for example is worth ten dollars. So if that valuation is true and they will push it to the upside. Just imagine the amount of demand that has been going to be put into place. So, for example, if there's 200 people who's willing to bid because they receive the news to be legitimate and it's pretty much as a hot commodity, like a property, when you want a property in a good location, you will do anything for it to, to fight for it. So if there's only going to be one seller who's willing to sell, and that one seller actually is the manufacturer who bought it at one dollar for twenty where he currently has twenty thousand in there that he created or basically that well the the factory built and it's a hot commodity. Just imagine the bidding on how they're going to go through it. The 200 basically buyers will be bidding on that price. It's a price war where this seller has a happy face because he's simply the only person who's got it. So when there's a lot of demand and there's a lot of speed and they're, they're the ones who's they're going to be competing amongst each other. So when that happens, the volatility will increase so much in terms of the speed. The speed is simply the acceleration between buyers who are bidding for the price. For example, the bid starts at one dollar. Imagine the person going to go like going going once, twice, then one, and all of a sudden they say no, two, then three, no, three fifty. So they're going as fast as they can, eliminating each other, and then at the end there's only going to be a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning only one buyer comes to one seller. If the seller accepts, then out of nowhere, no one's no longer going to bid the price, and it's now currently at, say, 990. It's getting closer to the valuation of 10, and all of a sudden, that one buyer 
is going same going once, twice, and then the auctioneer looks into the seller, do you accept it? And then the person says yes, then done. That's how price can continue to go to the upside. So that being said, who is this one person who has everything? Then your low will be an institutional price point. Your high will be also going to be an institutional price point. The close will be some form of institution well who would know that maybe perhaps despite that person bought it at 990 he might have insider information that the valuation of this commodity is actually worth twenty dollars which the rest of his competitors didn't know so when that happens he's got basically 990 and then the next day occurs once again then they will push the price even further so if, he, if that person knows something and in the end it could be also this the same person who is now has another person in the end and they want to basically buy more it could be it sometimes they do that they manipulate it so if the next day they know that some person knew more than the other and they started pushing the price and then it will beat another price and now there's more buyers than sellers once again since they know it's going to be worth more than twenty dollars it now ends up at say now fifteen bucks and they're willing to buy more than nine ninety then that creates now a higher high so an institution is willing to pay more than the last high then that's a good sign then that creates the continuation of the trend to the upside so you need four points in order for an uptrend to occur you need of course there is a high there is a low in order to create an uptrend is you need four points which decreates now the high is higher compared to the previous high which creates the definition of a higher high and the low is higher compared to the previous low which defines now the definition of a higher low same holds true to the downside that if institutions are not willing to go beyond the last high then that is not a good sign then that means they know that it's way too expensive so us being professional retail traders if an institution isn't willing to go beyond a certain high do we do we want to buy are you gonna buy it if an institution is willing to go to the previous high will you buy no. absolutely not so the bottom feeders will buy it. Why? Because their brokers are now nice, influencing them to buy it. Because they're saying, hey, it's going to be worth X amount of dollars, blah, 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 blah. Didn't you see the day before it went to the 52 week high or peak of, of the price? That's going to go further. Now, in order for them to sell, for institutions to sell, there has to be a sucker to buy it. Right? Then, if they're selling over here, if institutions are selling, then retailers or your bottom feeders, everything around this end will be buying it. Right? So that's how the beating of the war between a buyer and seller is being is a current occurrence in the marketplace. If there's a buyer, there's a seller, if there's a seller, there's a buyer. If there's a sucker, then there's going to be a winner. Right? So this is where we do not want to be part of is not you don't want to be part here on the retail selling we are professional retail traders who think like an institution to know where institutions are selling to know when institutions are buying that is the key and that is the goal so how do we know that if there will be selling is simply by looking clues these are your breadcrumbs these are what the breadcrumbs of what the market is basically leaving 
towards the door. So it's like, you know, if you see an animal, if you want to lure an animal, then you have to leave some form of breadcrumbs. And they like it, you just keep living, living, living. Like, uh, and then out of nowhere, they get, they get snatched. And that's how some animals are being slaughtered, because they're being lured into something, you know, basically as a trap. So, the advantage of this, though, is we're not being lured, we're actually being lured to make money. That once we see this type of clues, this is simply dictating a change of trend, a change of direction, a, uh, more of a forecast that will occur in the future with the highest probability, because that's what we want to be. Now, if technical analysis is defined as the study of price movement to forecast with the highest probability for the future using past and present price movement and if the key is forecasting then as technical analysts our job is to forecast where the future will lie based on the highest probability but to forecast you need to have evidence to read it or evidence on how to read price objectively by being objective, by seeing this, that is purely objectivity, that there's a higher high, higher low, which defines objectively an uptrend and downtrend. So how can we define a peak? A peak will only occur with three different price points. It has to have a higher high and it has to be a higher low. Like a, a roof like a hat, we can just simply call it a hat formation or a roof formation or an inverse V then in the middle will be your peak same holds true to the downside when you see a V formation and you have a series of lower low and a series of higher low the one in the middle is your confirmed low or your trough so in the markets, let me just erase this quickly. Once we get to the advance about law of harmonic vibration, on a straight line, this is what you will see an uptrend, likewise to the downside and the downtrend. But it's not realistic enough because if you see it charts, they oscillate. And that's how it's being performed. And inside here, they also oscillate. Simply put, there's a science behind technical analysis. If you see a calm or calm water, then out of nowhere, you drop a pebble to that water. What happens? You'll see a ripple effect. But if you really look into a third dimension of it, that ripple effect creates waves. It will create a peak. It will create a trough. Likewise, in the marketplace, they go in frequency, so they go in waves. Your trough and your peak is simply similar to a calm water that's being hit by if you drop a pebble or a rock then it will create waves so based on two dimension you can see that and similar to what um, Sarah was demonstrating earlier is going through through the chart where are the peaks where are the troughs to define a peak is using three or based on a, a v form of inverse V formation or a roof or a hat formation and the trough is a peak. Any questions, Raj or Sarah? No. Nothing? Clear as mud? So I'm trying to be clear, sorry. You know when you say the institutes don't accept it? 
Oh, I'm sorry, institu institution do not want, sorry, please. Sarah. Oh, when you're saying the, um, the institute are not prepared to pay a higher price. Yes. So, is that what you're saying, that they're causing this peak and these trusts, because they're the ones that are changing that, it's not through retail. So, yes. Retailers cannot resist the price, hence the term terminology resistance and support. Um, resistance is simply sellers are resisting price points at a certain high price. It cannot be you, it cannot be me. It has to be a big person in there, uh, an institution who has a lot of money or a lot of basically resource because just you know really think about it if something is just if a, if an institution is willing to pay the last high let's take real estate for example if the past price is a million dollars and someone is not willing to bid more than one million then out of nowhere you just basically stop at nine hundred thousand the question is why didn't that person go beyond a million so if an institution is basically not willing to go beyond one million then they know something they know something that maybe perhaps at this point in time the valuation of the property is not worth a million maybe sometime in the future but remember the price cannot just go in a straight line they need to correct itself before it can continue so just imagine this at this point the price uh, let me erase it to make it more clear at this point say the price ended at 750,000 But on the starting point, it was worth 500,000 of the property. There is a valuation that the property is worth $1 million. So you have one seller of the property. Now remember, you're now in an auction right here, then out of nowhere, there's 20 people who knew about it because everyone knew about it if it's a good location just imagine if all of a sudden people knew about it oh there's this property that has it's currently 500,000 it will double basically in two months time if everyone if someone will advertise that it won't be 20 people it will be probably 200 people in there trying to bid that price because they know that can they can make money because at this point in time, maybe perhaps that property is currently battered at this point. It needs some form of renovation. So, to get it at wholesale, these 20 people did their homework. Maybe perhaps they went through a bank and so forth, right? And now they're bidding on it. There's only going to be one seller. So, when they bid on that price, it went to as high as 750. That person basically was happy to sell it at 750,000 and then basically the seller is now gone now part of the 20 who basically now bid is only going to be one buyer again I mean here who bought it seven who bought it seven hundred fifty thousand since it's still the same the valuation is going to be more through and going to be a million so he renovated the property a little bit right then all of a sudden he put an ad in the paper it's going to be worth more than a million then rather than 20, there's now 40 people trying to bid on it. 40 compared now to 1. So, if someone is willing to go beyond now 750, at one point, the high is now worth a million dollars. So, this person who bought it on a million, from the transference now, become only 1 to 1, comes now zero this person is now here sitting at a million bucks then out of nowhere he tries to sell it 
he didn't get more than a million. His expectation that he's going to go to 1.5 didn't happen. Currently in recession, he wants to cut his the loss. Institution simply stated, well, now remember there's not going to be no just 20, 40 since maybe over here there's only now back to 25 once again. They're trying to beat on the price. So at this point in time, just imagine this. There's going to be people who are based in the past, they bought it for a million. You have, say, 40 sellers on this end now. Only 25 is trying to bid on it. Every seller, they want to get rid of the price. He's right on 750. They sold it now for 800,000. So, whoever wanted to buy, since no one is willing to buy, there's no longer demand of it. Whoever is willing to, try to buy at 800,000 might have known something. So, if this big person is not willing to go and surpass within that million, he knows some form of information. But the price kept dropping to the downside from a high credit now and low. So, you have a series of lower low on this end. So, that's how price is simply being dictated. Whether if someone is willing to pay, then great. Then it's a higher high, you have an uptrend. But if someone's not willing to pay anymore because it's too expensive, then automatically the price will actually drop because this is where now sellers are pushing the price now to the downside. And if there's no demand, then an automatic reaction of the price has to drop through simple basic economics, right, of supply and demand. And then at one point in time, since it's currently dropping, they have to retest the last low. Simply here, they need to retest, and then there will be a rebound. Once they retest the last supply, because what's happening is it needs to create more buying pressure again in the end in order for buyers to come in. Meaning, when it's something's way overbought, so from 200, all of a sudden there's nothing left. From 200 down to 1. Before the price will continue, they need to create some form of sellers. So sellers will be pushing the price to the downside to accumulate more buyers to the point to the downside because if there is going if the price will drop and they're saying you know what it's time to buy time to rebound buyers will be coming in that's how you create the push and pull between energies between the buyer and the seller so once there's more energy more buyers are coming in they will push the price to the upside to retest the supply if they're saying, well, based on the valuation of that pro of that asset, to go through, say, from one dollar to ten, fifteen to twenty, they have to retest ten, and they will create more buying pressure to break this price to go to twenty. Okay, so that's how trends are being formed. They have to test, retest. Part of the retest, either breakout, test, retest, breakout. That's how trends are being formed. Same holds true to the downside. The price cannot just free fall, because if it free falls, then not bad for that particular asset class. This is what happened based in 2008, where there's a lot of fear. So if there's a lot of fear, then there's no one buying, and hence that's why they, sh they shut down short selling. Only institutions can sell, because they have to create some form of buying, because if no one's buying, then that is going to tank like a bag of potatoes all the way down to zero. That's how Lehman Brothers and Bear Sands simply occurred, because it's bad blood for, for their business. A lot of fear, investors basically pulled out, no one's buying. And went then went bankrupt. It went down to zero. So people don't want that, right? And there's no demand. Ooh, ouch. So when price is dropping, they have to correct. 
to create some more selling pressure at the, at the top and then continues correction continuation okay so but how do we define the peaks how do we define the troughs to define the peaks in the trough is you need three different price points lower low higher low likewise to the upside how do we define the, the peak through a higher high, lower high. All right? Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. So uh, this time, uh, so Sarah, you're going to coach Raj. So Raj, I want to open up your uh, FXCM, and then you're going to define now your peaks and your troughs, similar like this. You're not really bothered about the body. You're only going to uh, focus on the highs, and you're only going to focus on the lows. All right, then Sarah is going to guide you, coach you, and see if you're doing the right thing, starting from the present. So when you're analyzing a chart, there's certain rules to analyze a chart. It needs at least around 72 candles. Okay, that's mainly that's the minimum. Greater than, that would be great. And then you are starting first from the present. And then to define your peaks and troughs is you go through bar by bar. And then when you define it, use the the box tool, the circle tool, to define your peaks and charts. All right. Any questions for Raj and Sarah for about the, about the exercise? No. Okay. Okay. Great. All right, so like that one right there, right, Raj? Beauty, three months, excellent. Okay, so Sarah, all yours to okay. help out Raj. So Raj, you want to start from the right side and then point out where you see the first peak and trough? Yep. So then who's the first Yep. Yeah, the first peak. So then just go up to the oval shape tool, which is just underneath the tab. If you go up, there's like a circle, the oval shape to draw. Is this one? Keep going right. No, keep going right. Further along. Is it, keep going. There's a line, and then next to the line oh, there's an oval one. shape. Yeah. So then the, one, yeah. to the side of it, there's a drop down arrow. Okay. And then, oh, that's side. Yep. Oh, let's tick now. If it, you might have to go back again. Go off again and then... Oh, yeah, that's it. So then just put one over the top of that. You might want to... Uh, yeah, you might want to just pull it out. So, uh, I just escaped with the escape button. And then you can... Oh, then you can drag it out. Um, Make it MVP. I did for three months. I could do one month. Is it bigger? All right, we'll try that. Can you make the screen bigger? To oh, maximize that. That's it, yeah. <coughs> okay, so first of all, from here. Okay. That's it. You can escape, do the escape button and then you can just drag it over. Or just actually with the arrows, pull it over. Oh, it's okay, just leave it this way. You don't have to do it again. Oh, sorry, it's gone. <laughs> or just okay. go over, now go over the oval and it will just pull out, the shape pulls out. You can just kind of pull it. 
that from mm -hmm. there. You can pull the out. You can pull the oval widthwise, so it actually oh. kind of sits on top. That's it. Oh, that's it. Yep, I'll pull it. That's it. Beautiful. Okay, so okay, now, now we're starting. Now we're starting from this one. So now you've done a peak. Now you now need to find a, a trough because mm -hmm. they usually come one after the other or just pairs. Let's see. Finish this this one again. Yep. Cancel that one. Oh. You can just escape and then push it through the arrow shape. Um. So click on that and then that's it. And then the arrow hover, hover over that shape and then it should let you add it. Then it should pull it out. Cool. And now find another peak. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yep, perfect. And now a trough. And I, now you, you've got one before that, I think, um, or maybe not. Um, oh, if you left click, no, not really. No, no, no. Sorry, no mistake. No, it has to be. So if you left click on that on that blue one next to the doji, the candle next to the doji. This one? Yeah, if you left click on that. Oh, sorry, did you do left click? Left click, yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you what the low was. So the low mm. was 144647. So then click on the one next to it. This candle, yeah. 14657. Five, so that. Six, four, seven. So that was higher. So that no, that's okay, isn't it? That's yeah. That's it's not that's not then. Lower. Yeah, that's slightly longer, isn't it? All right, just wanted to check that. Next All right. Is. So you want to find another P? Okay. Yeah. You might want to make it um, three months now for the time. So go to the day. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Is this enough, Ray? 
Can we keep going? Yeah, perfect. So, uh, I'm going to give you guys, uh, actually, that will be your homework. Okay, so each and every time, and the reason there's a purpose of why we do this, um, to find the peaks and troughs, and then once we get to the next level, you'll understand fully why. Right, so um, if you could just do two pairs, and, uh, whatever time frame that you choose, and then just email it to me, and I'm just gonna make sure just to double check. So three months if you're using a daily chart, use three months if you're using. I'm sorry, if you're using a four hourly chart, then at least about five days. If you're using the one hour, then at least around two days, or actually, uh, how many hours again? Maybe 20 hours, I think, but around that area. Right, so uh, so that's basically your homework. You guys got it. It's just simply of going through each one of them, doing it meticulously, and then you'll see exactly why we need to do those. All right, so it's giving you the ability to define your peaks and troughs. If there's almost close to certainty, like in terms of the same price, then use the, um, what do you call it, the tool. Do left click and you'll see the actual low itself. Because even with the point zero zero one, you got to use it. All right, any questions based on what we've done? Just can come in again, uh, Ray, the homework. So the homework is at least just to do two. So you can continue what you've done over here, um, Raj. To yeah. to send to email it to me, this is the easiest. Okay, um, go to file, please, Raj. Yeah. Save as. Save as image. There you go. And then say the Euro Aussie daily, and then you press save. And then when you send it to me, just do the attachment and it'll be easy. And well done, Sarah, for the coaching part, for te the teaching. So it makes a big difference, right? <laughs> mm, yeah, <it's> good. Okay. <laughs> when do you want this um, for next week? Is that what you want? Um, today is the 22nd and um, in the next 48 hours. Okay, yep. Can I ask you one question, Ray? Yeah, sure. With the competition that you had on for everybody, yes. uh -huh. you were saying about leverage. You said US dollar was leverage of 4%, is that right? Um, the US is simply we only have a 50 to 1, so a minimum of a 2% margin requirement. Um, and for non-US residents, you can have all the way to point two sometimes point even point one of a percent of a of a margin requirement meaning you guys now can have all the way to five hundred to one so the rule simply is that in order to be fair between uh, a U.S. resident and a non-U.S. resident is simply non-U.S. Re residents the maximum that they can use to put in is four percent of their account per of trade. Their account. Yes. Of their account for trade. Um, that they're willing, basically, the, the, that's the maximum they, they have to do based on the risk. And then for uh, US res residents, it's simply the maximum is 10%. Oh, okay. Yeah. So at so least like we'll have a little bit more of a, in order to be equal in terms, because it's like, say, if both is 10% and you're going to say, oh, I'm willing to put 10% in my account, say, for example, 1000 bucks, and you're willing to risk a hundred, a uh, hundred bucks. If you're going to use the calculator, it's going to tell you maybe you can put ten uh, lots in there. It could even you can put in well if you have thousand, you say have a uh, five hundred to one, or say even two hundred to one. You can put a normal standard account in there, mm -hmm. and then for a non-US uh, for a US resident, they can't put an one standard lot. They can only put um, say one micro or three micros. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, now if you if both entered and say both made a hundred pips, 
since you put in one started lot, then you make a thousand. You made a thousand. Then you just doubled your money straight away. Mm. Well, the person who only put three micro lots, then only make thirty bucks out of a thousand. They they only made three percent. So mm. that's why there's a big discrepancy in terms of the leverage, right? Um, leverage is fantastic as long as you know how to control your risk. So that's why it's part of the competition is those are the criteria is mainly non US based, four percent maximum, US based, ten percent maximum. So if uh, someone has got five trades in or that's twenty percent, that's mm -hmm. allowed to? Correct. Like they can have as many trades as they want in. As long as it's per Correct. As long as per trade is a maximum is four percent. Oh, I know. that I'm doing that, but I just wanted to question that. Then. No problem. <laughs> oh, okay. cool. No worries. So Raj, I'm gonna email you the uh, the recording of today, and um, um, I believe it's a good. It was a good session. It's a good class. If you could so. listen, it's an hour and a half uh, of it, and um, yeah, uh, I think no, Sarah was there, so Sarah will be able to share a little bit on what uh, she learned. Now, oh, yeah. yes, please. Oh, no, oh, well, they did a competition between the intermediate traders, and it was interesting that so the winning two basically just set their trade with their stop and their limit and left it and they got um, I think 16% Vicky was it 16 or, and then Anne got 11% uh, Vicky made 23.6% oh, and wow. then Anne made 11.87% yeah. so it's just good like uh, Vicky's just basically stuck with the trade and, and just whatever happened, she already made a decision and that was it. And you know, there's other traders who were a bit more micromanaging it and a bit more not believing in the system. Too many trades and they didn't come anywhere near, you know, uh, getting them out of percentage wins. So, yeah, it was good to see. Yeah. To see oh, really? I will listen to it. <laughs> I've got to yeah. go now. <laughs> no worries. Oh, okay. Yeah, Great. You're welcome. And then, um, yeah, since we're actually on track with uh, the Psychology 101, so I just wanted to get this small so that you guys to um, catch up. All right. Well, I uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next time, next class, and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.